Okay, let me start by explaining why I don't like the command system as often implemented. It's a lot of boilerplate. It looks like it's not because, oh, we've separated the functionality from uh, a certain thing. Uh, what people don't realize is they're either A, going to be writing hundreds of functions uh, and therefore hundreds of commands, or they're going to have to write some commands and in those commands have states that like vary how they work with uh, different contexts. And both of those are really not ideal. So uh, here's a very, very simple uh, way to set up a command system that is so powerful you can pretty much use it even for uh, asynchronous uh, sequencing of function calls. Uh, so starting here, uh, we have a simple root. Uh, it's just a node. Uh, inside that node is just a simple ready function. You can literally just create a new script and it should be good to go. Uh, under that is a simple view and then uh, under that is just a simple sprite. Uh, this sprite just so happens to be the Steam page for one of our games. I don't know how that got there. That sure is convenient. So here's the thing. Uh, any game engine worth its salt that these days has first class functions. If it doesn't, it's gonna suffer. Uh, Godot luckily actually does now. Now, the idea of first class functions is you can stick a function in a variable and Godot calls those callables. We'll stick with a var commands array callable. Uh, that's just going to store that like that right there. That's our list of commands. That's all we need, like bare minimum. Uh, we could do a for cmd callable in commands. Now we have a type safe way to x. What are you doing? Whoops. I did something wrong. What are we doing here? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So, how would we call a command? Uh, if it's in a callable, cmd.call. Uh, callables are always accessible using the call function. Uh, you can normally pass parameters in, and it would be the equivalent of calling that function with those parameters. Uh, but we're not going to do that right now because we're building out a command system. And if you notice in any other implementation based on classes, usually the execute or does not take parameters. Instead, what we do is we go back up to our command list. And here's where the magic really happens. We don't need to make a print command. We just need, say, the basic internal Godot printing command function, whatever, bind message. That must look really alien to some people, uh, but that is in fact just all you need. Uh, the bind will pass in a parameter automatically. Uh, there is a certain order to how this stuff works, but it's something you kind of get used to as you uh, mess with this kind of thinking. So we'll run it, and if you look down here, we can actually see it says message, which means the printing command actually works. Uh, that is kind of boring, isn't it? But here we go. Let's just inject another. Now we've got two commands. Run that again. Now we have message and message two. Notice how we are actually passing in the normal print function without any fancy boilerplate, without any secondary classes, and it all just works. Now, if you think this is cool and you're like going through some kind of like holy religious realization right now, uh, we're not done yet because this gets way, way crazier. Okay, so printing works. That means we have a very rudimentary command system. But now, Here's why I always tried to make a command system was because I needed to not only stockpile an order of stuff to happen, but I also needed to do it asynchronously. I do a lot of RPG work. I do a lot of stuff like that where I want to just pass a command that says display a text box, but I don't want to do the next thing until the text box goes away. So how do I do that? Well, uh, this is actually extraordinarily easy. So for the sake of cleanliness, we'll just stick to this one class right here. 
Now let's say we want to have a wait on whatever. We'll wait for like two seconds or something. Again, normally we have to make a class. We have to tell it like, oh, wait for this long. And maybe we pass in as a coroutine. Then we'll just await and we have the root calling with await. Uh, to explain how this would work, we'll put await there. Now everything will just be called like a coroutine. If you don't know what coroutines are, that's out of scope. I'm too lazy to teach that. Uh, we'll just say uh, wait for seconds. We'll take seconds as a float. And we don't really need a return for this. Oh, wait, we do. Whoops, well, I'm an idiot. Well, actually, we don't, do we? Uh, instead, we'll actually just uh, do this. Uh, engine. Don't worry about exactly what I'm typing here, but to explain what this is, I'm actually doing the long version of get tree. Uh, but for this, we can do this to create a timer, pass in the seconds. And uh, there we go. Whoops. Timeout. Uh, if you don't actually know what this does, it's a very simple command to get a timer, create a timer on the game tree. Uh, that's very internal stuff, but that's just a quick way to make a timer. We await until it times out, which means we await until seconds has passed, uh, and then we would resume to whatever the next in the caller is. So now we've got this. Uh, how do we get this in here? Uh, all we do, wait for seconds, dot bind, dot uh, 2.0, whatever. Whoops. We've actually just passed in uh, the function as our command. Now, when, uh, when I run this message, two seconds later, message two. There you go. Uh, it, it took me about maybe... 10 years to finally figure out how I would do this, and this is how I would do it. Okay, now here's where things get really fun. Uh, I've zoomed in a bit on the code because now you especially want to understand what's actually going on. So I've written a simple move thing function, and that's going to move the little sprite node. Uh, so we just take a node 2D, uh, we take a position we want to move it to, uh, we take the speed. Uh, your relatively typical normal moving stuff. Uh, so this is a very simple loop. Uh, while we are not approximately near the target position, uh, we are actually going to get delta our own selves because we do not have access to the process uh, function. Uh, normally, Godot's you know underscore process. That's actually where delta comes from. We don't actually have access to that here, but we can get it from the engine. So we are going to cheat and grab it from the engine with this little verbose uh, get main loop root get process delta time. Uh, and then we simply grab this current position and we move it towards target at speed. Uh, that's pretty normal if you've done your, your very, very basic hello world moving tutorial. Uh, this is important. Await engine get main loop process frame. This allows you to await on the process frame, which is uh, another way you can basically do what process does, but with a separate process. Uh, that's a very bad way to say it, but it allows you to run asynchronous processes. Uh, if we did not have this, uh, the entire program would freeze. So, uh... That's just our simple move function there. Uh, you can just CTRL click if you really need to know something. Remember, the entire Godot class library documentation is just in the engine. Uh, and now down here, now down here, we have move thing being called, or specifically it's being binded. Uh, we are setting the node we are setting vector zero so we can just move it to the center or whatever really fast. And we're moving at 100 speed because I don't want to wait. Now, this movement happens between two messages. So it should print message one, move until it reaches zero, and then print message two. And 
should we dare to run this piece of junk? We have this wonderful Steam page of a game that you should buy. And there we go, message two. So it allows you to set entire commands that are dependent on something happening and just letting it run until it's done. And this does not freeze your program and this does not require a ton of boilerplate and manual management. Isn't that fantastic? All right, so it's one thing to see how a feature is done, but why don't I actually walk you through how I actually use it? Uh, by using the fancy shenanigans of callables and first class functions as uh, commands, I've actually been able to build out a really nice RPG uh, cutscene, sequence, whatever you want to call it, scenario, builder based in uh, simple code. I don't even need to hook it up directly to a node or a resource because I just straight up use the scripts. Uh, so for example here, uh, I have two actors in this map using beta sprites for the sake of placeholder and uh, one of these is a more complicated NPC with behaviors and one of them is a simple one that just has like some associated dialogue that even the like actor node itself can overwrite with meta values. So let's start with the simple one here. Uh, it's hard to see because I'm too lazy to move myself. Uh, but it has some meta uh, string array and what happens is it will it, when you interact with something either by talk or check menu similar to Dragon Quest or Mother uh, you will uh, effectively trigger uh, a generation of an array of callables which is as we know our command system and so we'll say for example here when you talk to this NPC uh, all menus shut down, uh, the NPC will face you, uh, a specific emotion is set, and there's some uh, text nonsense going on. It doesn't matter for exactly what we're talking about, but this is how we implement stuff. Uh, and then we call the f uh, execute actions in the uh, field root, uh, just because the field root version of execute actions can also lock the, uh, some values and just make it so player can't move and stuff. There's a couple ways you could do this, and mine's not very good, but it's also very, very fast to implement. Uh, alternatively, we have uh, the check version down here, which will just display a narration. Uh, narration is a different kind of message, uh, just to have some distinguishment there. Uh, you'll notice I'm not using bind, uh, and that's because these functions, they are actually global static classes uh, referencing constant values uh, to scripts that are in their same folder for the sake of organization because I don't want to deal with files being all over the project and you can see stuff that here they are actually functions that call callables uh, so up here uh, we're actually returning a, a lambda or a function that we just kind of declare on the fly for the hell of it uh, with a bunch of behaviors set already so yeah, I haven't even talked about talked about closures and stuff yet but there are so many things that you can do uh, but none of that's important. None of that is important at all. Uh, that will be important later. Uh, so that's a simple NPC, and let's look at how it actually plays out. So I go in, I run the game, talk to this guy, and see the talking drops on a no message because that's what's set in the metadata. And no message for check, but you'll notice it's using a, the narration text box with no indication of who's speaking. Black magic. Uh, now for the more complicated NPC, it takes from a different script here. And if I look at it, you'll see all the same general components, but with some extra nonsense. Uh, first, we close all menus. Face position faces the player, basically. Uh, we start with the narration, and then we start with speaking, which has context like, yep, that's me talking, and here's an emotion. Uh, and then uh, we pick up some vectors, which are going to be relative to where the character is. Uh, and then we pass in uh, part of, or rather, we construct part of the array, which is the movement part. And this is where I can actually 
not only have a call for a motion, a movement, but actually a function that generates and does multiple movements at once. And I just have to pass an array of directions. That's why I just have an array of vectors here instead of anything else. Like, So I pass in an array of vectors. Uh, and you'll notice I have move relative and p match xz. Uh, if you look at chain movement, uh, it's all the way down here. Uh, here, chain move. You'll notice uh, we pass in the actor, as we saw before. The list, as I said, of positions, relative or absolute. Move type callable p done. p done stands for predicate done. Uh, predicate is basically just a function that returns bool. True or false? And this is an extension similar to the move function I did in the other thing. Uh, it generally just says, yeah, uh, we could split up the function's be uh, behavior uh, into parameters, and then you can just import those parameters. So I don't need, uh, for example, uh, a move relative chained where I pass in and then I have to do one for absolute I just do both that I could just write one and then I pass in the type of movement we're doing how do I know what what's p done do what's the p match xz up here p match xz uh, I take in two vector threes and I ignore the y value so I just say are we matching on x and z in that way if the height is off I don't care if the height is off I'm just going for of an exact uh, XZ position. Uh, XYZ. So let's say, okay, I want to, uh, I do want to know where it is in XYZ, and I do want to stop movement when it's exact. I don't want to ignore Y. Uh, if you look at this behavior again, you'll see P mooch XZ. I'm only moving to XZ. I don't want the player, or not the player, the, the actor to move up or down. Uh, and then messages too. It's just more of the same. Facing, speaking. Uh, and then we just await. And we execute all. LNG, what does that look like? Well, if you go over to this fellow here, you speak to the guy, there's the first section of uh, commands. Uh, it dumps the array vectors that I put in and starts the movement. And it's just moving with uh, all automatically and it's just built out the kind of function I want, and then it resumes with the next talk. And that's literally it. Check, it's just one message with narration. And that's really where the power of functional based stuff comes from. You can pass in callables to build the functions for you. Uh, the less work you have to do, the better, because I am personally a very lazy programmer and I don't want to do work. I'd rather the program build it for me. Anyways, uh, that's the gist of it. Uh, I've not done anything formal with this little video guide. I entirely just wanted to get some little notes out there as to how to practically do some crazy stuff with Godot that you might have never thought. Most importantly, build the build a powerful command system without wasting a bunch of time building out commands. I hate building out commands.